Welcome. This is the October 26 Beehive call. We have Yevgeny, Rod, Daniel, Jan, Antrenig, and myself, Michael, so far. I'm sure others will trickle in, but we have a bunch of topics. Uh, one of them, I just want to get it out there. Antrenig did some vCPU uh, load time testing. Rod, that might be of interest to you. Take a look at his results. I blasted out a quick script to... Uh, step through vCPU counts, and he found some very interesting things. Um, just to set some context, the FreeBSD Foundation has an enterprise working group that might be meeting again as soon as Friday. Uh, the invitation has not gone out, and uh, we're trying to synchronize with them on uh, attendees and such, but they've been uh, rather encouraging and exciting. Do look at the production user action items that I have linked here that will give you an idea of some of the prioritization we've done. And there is a related uh, jails list of features if you're interested. Um, <clears throat> let's see, real world issues. Uh, hopefully, John can join for these issues. Uh, yeah, Daniel, I know you're always pressed for time. You had a question about uh, best practices for cloning. Would you like to jump into those? And you've gained, yes, you have some comments. Yeah, sure. So for, for Beehive and, and Windows, I think it's reasonably clear because there's a, uh, there's a, there's a process called uh, sysprep, which, you know, which does it. And then, of course, you uh, re-randomize MAC addresses, uh, UUID, and uh, and and then and then run the sysprep pro uh, program, and it will take all of the it'll keep all of the users, all the applications on the on the system, but make them clonable so that you can you can keep the two Windows machines side by side, and that works in in all versions of Windows except for uh, basic home versions. Um, and then for all Unixes, I would assume that just changing, you know, changing the max is is usually going to be fine. But but a thought occurred to me that that the um, what, what do you call the identify the disk the disk unique identifiers that could cause trouble down the road and pool the, name. Yeah, there's also the UUI. Yeah, right. And then there's the uh, and then there's the host IDs. Uh, that that also could could cause trouble more well, maybe i mean maybe they maybe they won't but um some yeah so so just some thoughts about that and, and we're also wondering if such documentation exists out there um that that i could farm uh jan you had some observations Yes, so uh, FreeBSD at least uh, potentially saves the host uh, ID and UUID. Uh, it's that the first time you boot the system by the host ID RC.D script, but it's persisted to the file system so it doesn't change if you move the system to new, even virtual hardware. Mm, yeah, so this could cause, that on first for boot. example, major issues with... Uh, uh, because I think, for example, CAM uses this to tear multiple uh, initiators apart. So suddenly uh, the uh, protection against uh, connecting the same system multiple times to disks may not work and stuff like this. Um, so Beehive has a, 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 a dash U or dash something uh, option to specify the UUID. Specifying and saving the UUID on the file system is not really a good idea. Depends on what you want. John, you're pretty I, right. I'm I'm sorry, I can't you disagree with you, down. but I was voicing an opinion. Cool. Uh, there are arguments for both uh, behaviors. And the other problem... VM Beehive randomizes those for you if you don't if you don't specify as and automatically save it to the config but... file. So no, you, you can specify your own. You can specify your own UUID. Yes. You also can specify your own MAC address for the interface. Exactly. John, do you have and any way other... to turn down a little? You're pretty boomy. 
I'm sorry. Okay, if you can, thank you, and thanks for joining. Um, something else to think about is that uh, you only want to do that if you want to uh, basically uh, multiply the number of instances of a system. If you want to move it from one host to another, even if it's a cold migration, uh, you still want probably to preserve it all, except depending on your network design, maybe the MAC address. But with IPv6, that causes issues if you use a stateless auto configuration, because when your uh, global unicast addresses and multicast, ad uh, sorry, uh, and the local addresses will change. So, so, yeah. So that's probably all there is to it. There's there's nothing else to to think about, but uh... for some, uh, if you. Uh, well, there's one problem for some uh, distributions where you of Linux, I think they use file system UUIDs to identify the partitions. Right, that's one but, concern I was thinking of. What if I uh, need to move move disks back and forth between clones of each other? Exactly. Uh, this, uh, any form of RAID uh, is a major problem because the on-disk uh, Format normally identifies the disks, and suddenly, if you duplicate the disks, let's say you want to test a virtualized uh, free BSD system as your NFS server prototype, and then you clone this prototype, and suddenly, and then you reattach them and move them around, and suddenly you have a yeah a Z pool with identical IDs and so on, or a Gmail or whatever you're using. Geo multipath would be another problem case. Observations also, it looks like. Yep. First of all, uh, partition CUIDs are not Linux specific, they are GPT specific. Um, uh, it depends. Partition UUIDs are, but file system UUIDs aren't. Yep, yep, but file system UIDs are, of course, uh, they are spe file system specific, and of course, you can't combine uh, file system from three cloned VMs in, into another fourth VM. Yeah, but it but it's possible. It's possible anyway with with small uh, with small interactions, mental interactions. It's uh, often. Uh, it's often uh, the the actions performed by our cl uh, global cloud uh, users because all of the machines uh, created from uh, cloud images has similar file system UIDs. Is it clear, or should should I repeat, or should I recombine? Uh, we should all document. <laughs> that sounds like the number one concern out there. Uh, of, of course, it's not. It's not for documentation. It's it's just an opinion. Yeah. Uh, so I'm curious. Uh, in production, Daniel, you, Danny, when have you been burned by machines conflicting in ways you didn't expect? So I have. Um, well, really moving, mo mo Oh, go ahead. You, Danny. Taking a disk from one VM and uh, connecting the disk to another VM. This is a very simple and trivial uh, case. Okay. And you've not had issues? Even a boot, a boot device? Of course, first of all, this is a boot device. Uh, second is uh, similar UIDs uh, with similar labels. Hmm. In order to fix it, uh, I should boot with recovery media, something like system rescue CD in order to uh, change UID of a file system, change UID of a boot file system and or label, change the label of the file system. This is a very trivial way to fix it. Mm -hmm. Daniel, where have you been burned?
Uh, so actually, I, I haven't really. I mean, besides, you know, just uh, uh, MAC address problems, but but I am pl planning to use uh, use clones like this uh, far more often. And I definitely imagine some situations where I am going to be moving disks between systems that all, you know, though, though, I guess maybe if I move a disk, since it's a virtual disk, it might create a new ID for the disk on the, on the new VM anyway. Um, I don't know. John, do you have any insights from your experiences? Do I sound better? Yeah, perfect. Yes, thank you, sir. Um, so as a for instance, um, we run a large number of uh, Linux VMs. And when you generate them, they like to use uh, mounts and uh, kernel uh, on the, on the if, you're, if you're familiar with the uh, kernel options, uh, they like to use uh, labels and such. And we actually, uh, I do, I use uh, perfect clones of a file system so that every single system can run with the exact same options, um, which works fine. I have many, 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 over a thousand of those running. As far as FreeBSD is concerned, um, well, as far as the environment that we run, you've heard me say before that we run an environment where the, the MAC address follows the VM. We specify the MAC address and we use uh, cloud init to bring systems up. So basically a system, if I want to move a VM from point A to point B, I can take that VM and move it along with its cloud init scripts. And if I'm moving it into an environment where the networking is different, all I have to do is modify the cloud init script and the system will come up and, and quote unquote, do the right thing. Any other insights? Um, Rod, anyone who's go ahead, John. No, I was just saying I, I might, I need to, I could find you a, a usable example of the snapshotting I do on the way up for when I generate an image. Um, cool. Uh, Daniel, you brought this up. Does that answer your question or at least get you in, going in the right direction? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it probably would be nice to have a you know, if we want to put this on a rainy day list for something that would be useful to um, have as a sub page on the on the BI wiki. Agreed. Um, and get those napkin notes and post it notes going at least, and we'll you know reach out to you. Yeah, I've uh, someone internally working on this, so cool. I can I can put her on it. Got it. Okay. Uh. Related, this came up on a few calls recently, and it's actually, let's, I'll consider it related before we get into a little demo. So uh, on the jail call, we talked about the, the warm fuzzies of the promise of live migration. And then it rapidly got into the issues like, well, yeah, if you have all the identical, same identical hardware at both ends, and even in jail environments, you have the exact same kernel and user land. And if you are so hung up on live migration, well, uh, your application obviously wasn't designed to have any kind of downtime. So, um, John, I don't know if you were able to participate in those conversations, but uh, can we help paint the picture of the real world expectations on live migration? And you know, when is it uh, absolutely critical and when is it just uh, the promised land panacea that may in practice may not be as practical given say it's different generations of uh, server hardware etc discuss well from my perspective if we need to do live migration then i use a linux based qemu kvm uh, solution and i do not use beehive yet when if you're familiar with uh qemu you can actually specify 
the base machine type, um, you know, PC, XXX, whatever. And then when you migrate to the target machine, you emulate, you're emulating that exact same system and the, the emulation works fine. Okay. Emulation the, with the a performance hit or not? If I remember correctly from yeah. reading the documentation, you have to have system, yes, you have to define the intersection of uh, all systems you want to support. Correct. Okay. And then uh, the virtual machines basically get the feature bits uh, masked off, which is supported in hardware. But um, you can't mi live migrate as far as I know, for example, from AMD to Linux, while, uh, so, sorry, from AMD to Intel, because while they uh, have similar user space features, uh, the low level stuff is a bit too different. So you still need a compatible microarchitecture. So, so that said, John, your motivation is to truly move a machine or is it to do host OS updates or something else entirely? It maintenance mm -hmm. basically is the big okay. one. Um, Thank you. When, when we have a, we have systems that need maintenance done to them. Uh, we migrate the VMs off that system, that hypervisor, at which point we can perform maintenance. Yep. Uh, this allows us to perform maintenance during the day, uh, during normal work hours without having to plan uh, weekend downtime or anything like that. And when you have as many hypervisors as we do, it's basically uh, for that level of work, it becomes a requirement. Uh, so gut instinct, are there CPU features in Beehive that may want to be configurable and disableable to facilitate kind of a lowest common denominator as, virtual machine? As far as I know right now, the work for li on live migration only supports live migration between really identical microarchitectures. Right. So there is no support for masking anything off. You basically dump the CPU state bits yes. bit by bit uh, without any interpretation and filtering. Correct. So QEMU supports a CPU, which is referred to as host, H-O-S-T. And that simply means that the CPU you see in the virtual machine is basically identical to the CPU that the host hypervisor has. And that is what Beehive does by default. Ah, got it. So he, you're, you're correct. Um, for Beehive to be able to do any of my, any type of migration currently, we would have to migrate from uh, basically identical systems, which in the environment that I am in, that's a perfectly viable initial solution. Uh, Yevgeny, is your organization working on any form of Saber Store live migration? Yep. What can you tell us? Well, the first of all, our participation at uh, Saber Store or Suspend Resume on Checkpoint activities uh, were, were very big. There were Dozen of there were dozen of PRs uh, merged last year. Uh, also, uh, live migration uh, discussions and uh, planning features. What is the status? Are there open reviews that need review or development to be done or something else? As far as I know, there are few, uh, few, uh, few open uh, issues uh, to be completed. So most of all, uh, uh, are committed and completed. Okay. Uh, do you have any URLs for reviews or P or PRs that we should be aware of? Uh, 
I can't I can't provide it right now since the, the, there are a lot of them. Okay, understood. Well, let us know how we can help. That topic keeps com is back to coming up all the time. Um, and are you using the UPB code or a variation on it? Uh, the Bucharest code. Uh, well, uh, we we are using the code pro produced by our company and our teammates. Okay, understood. So, anything else relating to uh, live migration and the Saber Store? Well, the live migration uh, feature uh, very, is very complex and should be based on completely definitive uh, safe restore feature yep um, we, need, we need to complete it first ah, okay. and, and continue live migration then and that's still under review and development uh, th th these uh, improvements are still under heavy, heavy testing okay testing okay on, on the, oh. Yeah, I, on the topic of cross oh, yeah. CPU, cross CPU migration, um, I have quite a bit of experience in the ESXi environment. It was probably the first successful one to attack this type of problem. And the the biggest thing is like QEMU is what we need to add a feature that would basically either allow us to specify a virtualized CPU. I believe QMU has something called the, the generic 64 that's kind of a, a very trimmed down set of, a, of the 64-bit architecture. It removes most of the, the CPU features and stuff um, from the gas. And that would probably be the simplest, easiest thing to implement in Beehive would be to simply create a, a subclass CPU that's is pretty generic to basically all anything that can run Beehive can support a guest with these sets of flags in it. Um, ESXi is is the opposite end of that scale. It's a very complicated thing in that you actually end up specifying um, uh, match and mask bits that you drop out of the CPU ID and other stuff. And it gets really complicated because you're trying to, you end up, you need to block out machine specific registers and, and everything else. As far as migrating Intel to AMD or AMD to Intel, not going to happen. Even yes, even VMware hasn't managed to make that work. You can do a cold migration, but you're not going to do a live. Um, I agree. There, there, there are just too many architectural differences, even in the, it, well, especially in the um, virtualization code base. There's actually Intel and, and AMD's uh, virtualization implementations are pretty different. So I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. But I, other than possibly, possibly this. If we take a close look at this QMA generic 64 CPU configuration, that one might actually be able to migrate because I think it hides all of that, um, all of those details. So, so um, Apple has taken this approach that uh, they um, kind of hide it from you by for, uh, always having their virtual machine monitor loaded and you can't write your own one. You always have to target theirs because it's always already initialized uh, with the hypervisor framework. Well, well that's in the host side. Targets. Isn't that in the host side thing? Yeah. That's, just like, we, that's just like by def default, I think if, if we, we don't load VMM by default, but they are exactly 
So once you have this level of abstraction, it, theoretically it could have a way to basically dump and uh, export or import a dump the state, but this isn't really an important use case, I think. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's relevant at all to the discussion of, of what CPU stuff we present to the, to the gas. Yet neither have solved it. QEM, UKVM and ESX IVMware have not solved a generic basic um, machine. As far as I'm aware, okay. I'm, I just I recently looked to make sure that that um, uh, VMware is still recommended procedure if you need to migrate a VM from an Intel architecture to an AMD is to cold migrate it. Got it. Which I mean, cold migration works because you're you're not dependent upon CPU features, but. Mm -hmm. um, Live migration, you've just got too many runtime dependencies between the two. Cool. Uh, let's but see. I do. I still believe it might be possible to find an architecture, but but realize VMware doesn't have this. They don't define. They don't define a generic sixty-four bit gas thing. They actually, you have to do that by use of, of um, CPU ID flags. Or mask actually, you mask out bits so that the guest can't see it. I see. And I think a, the different approach, like QAMU does, what? which is is to specify a CPU class that you're emulating. The other part is the host part, where you would have to uh, basically take the data structure for one microarchitecture right now and convert it to the one for the other one. Even if it's semantically equivalent, it's still an other bit pattern in memory. <laughs> yeah, okay, I've, I'm not sure if we're still saving the, um, what's supposed to be an opaque object that you're not supposed to peek inside of it all, which is the, the VM state block. Um, that's very much tied to the microarchitecture of the CPU you're migrating. And I believe we still are using that in the live migration code. Okay, anything else on those topics or do we want to see a process supervision demo from Antrenig and Jan, sometimes known as the Antrenig? Your, your question there about the VM state block being an opaque object, it is an opaque object. You, you're not supposed to muck around inside of it. Got it. I mean, you fix that. <laughs> okay, other questions or issues, or shall we jump into a demo? Uh, I did send you from the a question you had for me earlier on. I sent a simple example of the uh, effect of running our cloud knit scripts at setup time for an image to show what it looks like at the on the file system. So, and that's the SRV thirty one A, etc. Yes. So, okay, I'll paste it. What are we looking at? It wasn't clear as related to file system. Let's see. That so you're you're clear. looking you're looking at a, a file server. Okay. And the the pool name is is server 31A and the volume the the data set is GPU 2001. Um our VM start numbering it at 2000 so it's okay. actually just the first system. And we actually snapshot the pool the we the volume went or excuse me we snapshot the data set when it's empty. And that's what the first empty is. And that makes it very, very easy to take a data set and uh, bring it back to null in like a split second. Yep, absolutely. That's um, an awesome technique. Yeah, and that way we don't have to... Can... Go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. My installer scripts do the same thing. 
Okay. I do it for object directories because um, yeah. you know, no flags to clean up. Go ahead. Right. Then we uh, the parent the 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 control process DDs the actual uh, flat image into the into that area, and we then snapshot it again as DD image, and we boot everything up, and control goes into the image. We have a we do a bunch of stuff to it pre grow FS. We then issue a grow FS against it and do additional setups. And after all that setup is done, we then uh, we then re-enable cloud init um, and pass that last image off to the developer or user of the system. And then if they were to issue a uh, a rollback operation, the default is to go back to cloud init, which is the the, the system as defined that we gave them. They, they, I did not provide any examples, but they can actually create their own. They could, in theory, uh, make additional modifications to the system and then create their own snapshot underneath cloud init. So when we actually take a, if we were to take this particular system and duplicate it, I would just issue a send operation uh, on this from point A to point B. This particular system is on a, a generic server and is accessed uh, via the network to the, to the hypervisor. Um, so in theory, if I want to, if, if I move this system from hypervisor A to hypervisor B, we don't really, this image itself doesn't have to move. The, the new hypervisor on the, on the new system simply accesses it and they're on their way. But that's, I, I, the, I hope this, helps answer the question you had earlier. I don't know if I'm doing it perfectly, but there you go. Appreciated. Thank you, John. And yes. Yeah, you'll and you'll notice that the snapshots, that's actually a date timestamp image that's in the middle of it. So this particular image was put together earlier this year in what, uh, May? May. <laughs> yep. Yes. Cool. Any questions for John? Is it demo time? Antonig, you ready? Test, test. Test, test. It's working. OK. So uh, do you want to share your screen? I think I should. Indeed. OK. Um, Let it rip. What? Let me see if I have everything ready. Okay, I did crash something. Of course, at the demo, something should have crashed. But yes, I should be able to demo what's needed. Uh, maybe better if I do my whole screen in this case. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, Very good. great. So um, the, the idea of this demo is to have a supervision tree for Beehive. Um, this, uh, this, is this is based on the work that Jan has done using SV. There are a lot of files here, don't worry, we won't be using all of them. Um, and uh, who, for who, those who are not familiar, SV is a uh, init system, actually it's called Runit, man Runit. Uh, it's called the uh, it's it's a, it's an init system that technically co can also replace um, the FreeBSDs in it if you want to, and uh, it 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 also can run next to it, so it would run some of the processes. Uh, it's also compatible with um, the the daemon tools. So uh, the way that this script works is that there's a directory. And the directory has a uh, config a, a file called run, which is where Beehive does all of its things, uh, such as its configuration, ROMs, VARs, um, bridge interfaces, etc. But these are things, of course, that the user can specify in a config file. So this is it's it's a pretty large, uh, well, not that large. It's 160 line of code. Uh, this is the um, uh, run script for. Um, uh, run it. It also has another one that is called finish, which is where the actual interesting things happen that we've been lacking for years, such as 
the guest has requested reboot or the guest has requested power off, halting, the guest has triple faulted, etc. And it also has a proper controlling mechanism using the SV command. So you can tell it to shut down. You can tell it to start, stop, enable, disable. Well, technically enabling and disabling are done in a directory called var service, where you would put all of your configuration. Uh, they are just uh, the directory symlinks to the directory where beehives, uh, where the beehive um, uh, SV directory is. So that's the <clears throat> idea of how it works. <clears throat> um, I have converted this into a make file that looks less or so like this. Uh, let me give an example in this other machine. <clears throat> um, if, uh -huh. And uh, let's do a git pull. I've <clears throat> changed some stuff. Okay. So you would start with a make, which will give you a um, usage way of how to do this. You can start with make intro. That explains what you need to install first. <clears throat> In this case, you would apologize. My, my uh, throat is doing something. Likewise. <laughs> So while Antronek uh, is We're muted, um, <laughs> this is a little nasty hack to make sure that the supervising a tree of processes uh, gets restarted if you accidentally kill dash nine something or, or things crash. In other ways, um, just like a get TTY would be restarted, okay. the previous the init process will restart the supervision tree if you hook it into etc TTYs. That's why we're using the etc TTYs. Otherwise, technically, you can also just do uh, you could also technically do CSRC. Um, you know, uh, I think it's called run it enable or run as video enable. Um, so you could do that too, but we, we think that this is a way better and a cleaner way that you will actually have a proper supervision tree. Uh, I do have to ask Jan, if a user goes into a single user mode, what would happen then? Um, then it's not started because you only okay. have a single login shell then and in it does not process etc TTYs in single user mode. Got it. Okay. That was actually very good. So uh, currently you're using etc TTYs and modifying it on the system? <clears throat> Uh, yes, we are modifying it. There's also a hidden target that is not documented here for this specific purpose, so no one runs it accidentally. You could run <clears throat> make init, which will <clears throat> create, which will download the package, <laughs> modify Etsy TTYs as needed, modify Etsy TTYs as needed, and it will also let's see what else it does. And that that's pretty much it, actually, what it does. Do you think FreeBSD uh, update would? break that for you at the sort of feature won't. okay it, it it doesn't no the, the uh, actually as a matter of fact if 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 there is a change in the uh, ttys by the upstream you will get the pager that says uh, oh there is a diff please okay. you know modify okay. current yeah so that's that, 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 that's what would happen uh, another things that we have in here is make uh let's see make make setup this is the fun part less or so it does very basic things. It converts the sample to non-sample, and uh, it creates some directories that um, run it needs. In this case, log, supervise, supervise, etc. It creates some FIFO files that also SV needs, um, and also it truncates 10 gigs of disk. Now, the goal, I started with a make file just to make it easy and you know hackable right now, but the goal is to convert this to a shell script where the user could specify the size of the disk, et cetera, et cetera. And um, well, the thing that I don't know much about, but you guys know better, is the following file, beehive.com, where the user can start specifying things such as the CPU, the uh, memory size, the disk, it defaults to disk zero, very much VM beehive style, and uh, the rest of the configuration. You can have you know, the path to the image, the uh, block media, and specify whatever else you need in the mix, etc. Uh, in an ideal scenario, I would also like to convert all of this to be generated by a shell script rather than a dot sample file. So in let's say you would have SVB hive setup 
and then you would give it the arguments that you want for you know uh, the, the the memory etc and it will generate it for you so you don't have to modify at least for the first time you will not need to modify unless you know what you're doing <clears throat> and uh, then we would have something like make uh, what's the next one make start and Jan, i i think i crashed something in here while while i was hacking around uh correct me if i'm wrong i'm getting you know sv not starting but that's weird because i thought that i did start it any idea yes um so um okay it's one uh can you install dtps3 and uh, show you the output of dtps3 dash uppercase u um ta uh, yes dtps3 dash uppercase u and what ta There you go. This is a very accurate <laughs> command uh, arguments that you gave. Yes. So this is the idea of how SV would run. Um, uh, uh, the goal is to convert this into a uh, proper shell script because make files are not a good idea uh, for a situation like this. And the end result would be to do something like this, where you would have a, well, we would publish a Git repo, probably under Michael's uh, GitHub, or maybe we would, would, would even convert it to port or something. And you could either do Git clone or uh, CP archive of the, uh, let's do it. Let's see if the clone is in there. No, okay, so in this case, I'll just need to do it manually. Um, SSH. So, um, Anthony? Yes, dear. Uh, just a question. Can you run dwatch exec ve to see if it tries to restart something every second? You watch. No, no, not ex exec ve. So let's see what it does. That's interesting. So it doesn't try to restart anything um, because we are missing processes. Wait. Yeah, you can okay. close that. It's not tr even trying to start up. Okay. Uh, can you just try to run? Did you copy the uh, ex whole uh, crappy example I gave? Because then just try to run the script in user lib exec run as video. Uh, as video runs from the TTY, sorry. Yeah, but the things. script, the, which, uh, wait a second. If you modified the system, have you even asked the kernel to start it? By sending a sick hub to uh, sorry the init system to start it. Uh, the, the system has. And been... wait a second, why are you passing it? The <laughs> you did not copy it verbatim. Uh, what you're doing here is uh, okay. You're doing something different. Okay. Which explains why it doesn't work. <laughs> Okay. Okay. That yes, because the way that you did it on the other machine, uh, yeah, you used. Let's see. I used a script as an user Yes. Yeah, yes. And I've wrote this little shell script, and it knows how to run in the environment, and it provides with no it. useful okay. path and uh, the ex the argument it doesn't need a uh, given from in it. So because okay. of that. And yep. the right I/O redirection stuff so that it runs with def null yes. as standard input, and standard out and error redirected into the pipe, yes. connecting it to its dedicating logging process. If you don't do that, you will lose the standard error output. Oh, of course. And stuff like which is what I'm using to report uh, service restarts, so okay. that if inside the run script you write to uh, or finish script. So it means that this one is going because on this other machine I wanted to be as less what do you call intrusive. what do you call that intrusive yes as less intrusive as possible for for a fresh machine uh, so apparently I did I didn't copy that part properly uh, and then if we do run this then because SV is running on this machine it should give us oh see it, it keeps giving me the same thing because I'm I, I was pretty sure that I copied the minimum needs. Mm. 
to run DTPS3 on the machine you think it should be running DTPS3 on? DTPS3 dash, what was the flags? VTA? It's in the chat. Code. Oh. Yeah. Chat, chat, chat. Capital U, lowercase T, I believe. Yes. There you go. Probably want it like this, rather. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so here we have the processes running. But not the Beehive one. Now, if you go to uh, the VAR service Beehive VM0 directory. Yeah, and doing sv zero. start dot. Yeah, this is the VM0 directory. I want to use the new yeah. one, which is the Beehive. Uh, dot, yeah, dot, that dot. Uh, will only work when you sim link it in there. Yes. So it Have would you go done that? to, no, it would be, oh, I hate LN, wait, the other way around. Uh, <laughs> I would uh, recommend using relative paths because, so uh, enter the directory where you want to have the yes. symlink to live so that the shell makes more sense. And relative paths have the advantage of uh, working as you expect when you change root or jail. Hmm. So And now we do have it. Yeah, and within five seconds, run as video will pick up the change. Mm -hmm. And, we and can do start the run as V, so the supervisor for the single uh, dub, dub. service. And it's currently down, okay. normally up, want up. Can you? Means... Yep, go on. Yeah, just try SV start in uh, Beehive uh, dash www. And there we go. And now Beehive would start running. Obviously, this is an empty disk, so Beehive would just, you know, do nothing. That, that It should point. sit at the uh, UEFI prompt if you have one. Yes, it's, it, yeah. yes, it's your same config. So I think we should also get a CU. What's the doing the flag, or can I just connect? Dash L. Dash L, thank you. Um, <clears throat> would be dev. NMDM. And then you can use top completion. Name. Yes. And you want the uh, B end of the virtual null modem. Um, uh, 3B. No, no the, there you will see nothing. Okay. Come you 1B? want 1B. One one okay. There you should now uh, hit something. Yeah. You have the there UEFI. UEFI yes. Cool. Yes. yes. If you type exit, you see the uh, menu you here. Yes. So this is the overall idea. Obviously, it's very uh, raw, I want to say, at the moment until it's converted to a proper shell script. Um, Ayan, I do have one question. So um, while I was hacking around, what I realized is that if the user changes the directory of the beehive, if the user changes the directory of the beehive, in this case, the you know, say the beehive dub 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 directory, then things are gonna go uh, failing. Um, do we have any, securities around it or like what would happen in that scenario any idea or like should we just assume that the user is a smart and they will never do if you like uh, break the sim link you break it okay that it's that simple don't do that sounds like a developmental question so this is in the context of five or so years of requests for super process supervision related to beehive i'd love to hear from the panel if this feels like the right approach. So, um, Anthony, can you uh, share your screen again for a second? Of course. Um, so if I, if you are using the same lab machine I uh, used to show to um, Michael, uh, then the VM uh, zero machine should be usable. Yes. So uh, unless there's something there which should not end up on the recording, uh, we can use that to play with. So what something else I did, which is often annoying with Beehive is that basically the kernel messages from the guest side are lost because normally they end up on a virtual serial port with no one uh, listening or even just buffering the output. 
So mm -hmm. that when your guest uh, is broken, you have no idea why, because mm -hmm. the uh, system log messages to the uh, kernel log have just been lost. Uh, and that is what uh, the little slurp service does. I've configured this example FreeBSD uh, guest in such a way that it um, uses the first virtual serial port, so basically COM1, um, for the UEFI uh, as usual, for the bootloader and as lock and shell, so basically for everything you normally would use, except for a system console, so that the system will um, write the kernel messages to uh, de def nmdm uh, com2a. And there's a simple logging uh, process reading from the com2b, our end of the virtual null modem cable, and just writing everything there to a uh, log and rotating the log when it gets too old or too large. So if you just try to cut slash var log vmb hive, uh, sorry, slurp, I think, oh, what is slurp, I think, yeah. Just a uh, count. Is there anything in that? Yep, it's the... Should it be the slurp directory? No, no, the, the slurp one, not the count. Yep. It doesn't decode the um, messages at all. So it's a line by line log. Each line gets a timestamp and it doesn't do any special handling for escape sequences, which is why the uh, FreeBSD boot menu, which gets animated, looks a bit strange with a lot of empty lines here. Oh, yeah, I can picture that. Uh, but other than that, it works and your crash messages will just be there. And the double new lines are because uh, the um, guest uses the usual convention for serial ports, so it uses carriage return new line. Uh, you could set the uh, use STTY to fix that, but yeah. Does this have any protections from boot loops? Uh, you have to implement that yourself in Got the it. finished script. Okay, um, so gang, uh, I'd love to hear feedback on this approach. This is based on several years of the question and it's been brought to the forefront. The, uh, and I have to say the idea that I imagine is either converting this to a, a port where someone could do uh, SVB hive in it and it will create a directory with all of its FIFOs and everything in there and now you can start using it. Just like in this case, we had beehive dub 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 or beehive vm zero. Uh, that's one approach, and then you, it will also have the appropriate dependencies, of course, of you know run it etc cetera, etc cetera, and the beehive uh, variables and all of those. That's one option, and the other option is having it as a Git repository somewhere where people could clone it and start working in it directly and clone every time that you need to, you know, uh, build a new VM. Well, uh, and door number three, what would be a, fe a feasible in-base solution? I know things like run it are quite small and permissibly licensed, so they could get a new name and possibly drop into base, but that's a highly sensitive topic. If anything, I'd love some feedback from, say, John and Rodney on this general approach. John, I see you've unmuted. Um, Guns blazing. I do something similar, but I use Tmux. And when you bring a, when I bring up a Beehive process, or if I bring up a QEMU process, I attach their standard out to the standard out, standard in to the, to a Tmux process via SOCAT. And that Tmux process does not go away when the Beehive process exits. It stays there and it is listening on the appropriate uh, endpoints. When you reboot or bring your VM back up, you still have access to all of the console information that was there last time. And that can, of course, be programmatically uh, accessed via the appropriate TMUX subcommands if you want to 
uh, programmatically search it or, or do something like that. Um, this mechanism was partly arrived at because we have many different uh, operating systems that run in the VMs, and I don't necessarily have the ability to manipulate the the VM to you know tell it to do uh, something with uh, standard in standard out versus standard error or what have you on the various COM ports for the console versus uh, standard in standard out. Um, John, are you handling the return values from the Beehive process? Like, hey, I rebooted, hey, I... Yes. Okay. So what really happens is in our environment, we have a, a small database of configuration items for a VM. We then take those configuration items and we dynamically generate a, a shell script. And that dynamically generated shell script is then used to control the VM, to start it, stop it, et cetera, et cetera. That shell script, when it, uh, it is executed, it puts, uh, it waits for uh, Beehive to exit. And depending upon the exit code, it will, it will restart the process. It'll restart via the Beehive process. If it exits for you know, any other uh, negative reason, it then deallocates all of the resources that were allocated for that particular VM, and then it exits. I see. Um, uh, uh, <coughs> bless you. Uh, John, while uh, I love this approach with SV, and SV is very rock solid, I was wondering if you can open source your solution. And because it doesn't rely on SV, right? However, I was wondering, Jan, your idea, since apparently there is no technically a supervision tree, Right, but rather it's something running in Tmux. Uh, how how do we want to go into having this in base? So, given how small, just something like run SV, just the little supervisor and its command interfaces, it would could be even smaller than the existing daemon command. Mm -hmm. uh, and that FreeBSD has a bunch of non POSIX. Uh, APIs available, uh, which would make it a lot more comfortable to write such a thing, like process descriptors, KQ, um, and the like. So you could have a single supervision process for multiple children uh, easily and in a race-free way. Yeah, it should be probably less than a thousand lines of code and see. But yeah, getting that upstream is a bike shedding discussion waiting to happen. Mm, so I would Tmux. argue for just uh, keeping it in ports for, until uh, there is demand. <laughs> My Michael, do you want or not want Tmux in, in base? Oh, gee, Tmux and OpenRSync and all the wonderful goodies in OpenBSD would be lovely whenever possible. Tmux isn't going to go into base. I know, but I, it's the first thing I install on any system, and uh, you can debate against screen yes, all you edge. want. Anyway. I'm happy that OpenBSD has it in base. Okay. And okay. Uh, yeah, John, for the open sourcing part, uh, or you can go with no no comment since oh. I know it's a commercial work. Um, the, the concept of being able to open source some of the work that I have done over the years has been discussed and it's an ongoing discussion. Um, but no, I can't just take 30,000 lines of shell code and, <laughs> um, and post it and have people be happy with me. And the moment you said okay. database for the configuration, I suspect that is part of a much bigger ecosystem that we are not interested yeah. in. Well, you, you are and you aren't. Okay. It uh, you know how many so how many uh, network devices do you want your VM to have? Hmm. I I run VMs that have six. That's the most I've seen so far. Um, and how do we keep track of that? And we you know we had this discussion the other day about um, we 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 I think we it was you know we referred to as referred to it as enterprise. And I realized that the majority of VMs out there in the world don't have six, but here we have the need to, to be able to do so. Um, those resources have to be allocated. MAC addresses have to be tracked. Uh, resources have to be deallocated. 
uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I recognize that a lot of that probably isn't of major interest if we were to open source this kind of thing, but the the ability is there. Uh, and uh, Michael, since this whole thing was your idea, how happy are you with the usage? Well, well hold on, backing up. This is backing Jan up. initiating this for years with proper supervision. Uh, I'm curious for both of you, could you shim in Tmux and or screen for those who celebrate as an alternative wrapper? Because maybe it would drop in without too much trouble. I mean, you if can... when I create the when I uh, create the shell script for management, it could be as simple as, you know, SVP hive attach and it would call Tmux from underneath or call CU from underneath. Basically, I want to do the jailer methodology here. I don't want the user to ever touch Beehive, right. uh, ZFS, truncate, CU, or if config manually. Um, one of the problems with putting Tmux in between is that Tmux will eat the signals, and there are some signals it can't forward, I see. like the kill or, or stop. So. Um, you will lose the ability to use the supervisor process to uh, reliably signal the Beehive process. Understood. Uh, yeah. And the other problem is if you want to do such things, yes, Tmux ca sessions can have even text injected into them and so on. It's scriptable, but it's it's worse than using GNU expect to script things. I uh, blogged exactly that, and I thought it was quite cool to find it. <laughs> Anyway, so, yeah. Anshani, to answer your question, uh, I simply, I simply no, think it's... the world will expect an RC behavior. There's nothing preventing you from wrapping it all up with an RC script so that you can just use service, yep, exactly. Beehive, whatever, to manage it. And it's just busy the <coughs> advisor That's... and the like, it's just an implementation detail then. That is very good to hear. So there's no way, uh, no reason why users would have to learn about run it unless they want to look under the hood or it exploded because they messed with it without even looking under the hood. Okay. That said, I was expecting more opinions, uh, possibly supportive, possibly not so supportive from say Rod and maybe even Daniel Nyevgeny. Uh, does this feel like a positive uh, development? VMrun.sh has always been very limited and uh, limited to a certain OS. And well, this helps address that. That, that, uh, that depends on goals uh, and uh, best practice uh, because uh, uh, such things like uh, definitive managers uh, must be infrastructure aware or must be enterprise aware in case you in case you just want a manager the box like manager you need no infrastructure you need no enterprise understood And Daniel had to step away. Rodney, any feedback? Not really. And one broader. I posted, goal. A, sam I posted a sample uh, Tmux initiation. Okay. Thank you. I see it. Um, one broader goal of the working group from the foundation is that all the, at their discretion, the various Beehive managers or jail and VM managers could share some infrastructure within the operating system as opposed to reinventing the wheel often wrong every single time. So, so what, thank you for that example, but. Um, what could be done? Yes. It would be nice for all the talk about live migration and suspend and resume of Beehive guests, there exists an uh, IPC socket mechanism. 
uh, the same mechanism because it uses Unix sockets could be used to basically allow you to attach a console on demand. Um, and then Beehive could just keep a ring buffer and would basically dump the last few kilobytes of console output to each new session. Hmm. And that would, unless you're using a very complicated end cursor application at the time, the last few kilobytes should get you close enough synchronized for it to work uh, <laughs> as expected. I have a I have a question, and uh, this is because live migration means different things to different vendors. When we mean live migration, do we mean that the Beehive process will be paused and moved and restarted, or rather, you know, continued, or do we mean moving while it's still running without pausing? You I'm always sure. My, my yeah. environment, it means moving while running. Moving so, while running, so you don't even pause it. Well, you always have to pause for a short duration. You so you can't really run them in lockstep and then stop the other one. This is this type of a coupling is possible, and it's not the process which gets moved, but the guest state. Yes, correct. So the question is how long of the interruption is acceptable and maybe an implementation detail is that that comes more down to the network. What do you do with the packets which arrive while you uh, have a pause? Do they get buffered and replayed uh, or are they lost? So Does QEMU do magic with incoming packets during migration? QEMU KVM? Uh, incoming TCP packets will be dropped because they didn't get act appropriately. They'll be resent by the server side. Okay. Um, that's basically the same thing that uh, uh, ESXi does minus a few fancy things. The test is usually somebody bringing up a web browser in a VM and watching a YouTube video while they migrate it to a new hypervisor. Mm -hmm. Which is a really quite forgiving use case because... yeah no arguments either way it's just yeah you know, the more one would do. be uh things like i don't know uh, what happens when i'm live migrating my music playing demon server does the audio stutter mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that would be the torture case And not to bring in any jail subjects here, apologies. Um, but if we had like an, uh, an what do you call that, um, an an abstraction on top or below, I'm not sure the idea of a process. Because you know, migrating a jail basically means migrating a Unix process at the end of the day. You know, um, is that even possible in any operating system, even the non-Unix ones, like Plan 9 or something, to migrate a process? And that's um, called checkpointing, right? You sort of freeze it and push it around? Yeah. Wrong. There have been such cluster operating systems, but normally uh, not a Unix one. I think it has been done, but I'm not aware of any relevant production system supporting this these days that you have a multi-kernel distributed system with POSIX like semantics. So it, it doesn't work the way that Unix does, but the mainframe has yeah. supported check checkpoint restore mechanism since the literally the 70s. It's, but for example, you would also have to be able to move file descriptors around and do re remote file descriptor operations. It's really a very low level integration you need. You need a shared file system. You need a shared process namespace and so on. So it becomes really a major change to how a kernel is even thought about, not just how it's implemented. Yes, we won't solve that on this call, will we now? No. No. Okay. no, no, no. Sorry, apologies for that. But and I, it's I not know... even something we have to solve because the hypervisor is in between and it's the abstraction level. 
I, I want to clarify something on mainframe checkpoint operations. That doesn't allow you to migrate a process from one CPU to another. That allows you to uh, restart. That allows you to restart a CPU on the current machine at its current point. Yes. No, I take that back. You can start it up on a different CPU. On the same machine. On the, the same machine, machine, yes. Okay. It doesn't, the problem it doesn't is on the mainframe, the definition of machine becomes very, very squishy. Yes, yes but it's not going to allow you to migrate it from one mainframe to another. One right? mainframe to another mainframe. <laughs> yeah. If if I were to do a hard uh, operation and completely pause the process, I could take that process and move it to another system. Part of that pausing is a a saving of we call them file descriptors but the it's a pausing of all of the io on the mainframe along with the state for all of the open uh file um if any of you have it's, uh, DC, does D, uh, does dcb sound familiar to anybody data control block yep. yeah um all of that state information is saved and then when you restart it all your all your files are accessed in the right place etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. um but it, that whatever, I don't know if we're getting off topic. I'm just trying to say that the, the implementations are out there. They work there. They have a lot of history and technical debt in them. Yeah. Yes. Probably the so, best thing to go look at would, would be Sprite um, from the University of 